Okay, let's uh, get started with the first uh, tech talk for the day. I have to say I ran upstairs for a minute just to check on something, and those industry people just didn't have the technology figured out. So I come down here to the tech talk, everything's working, everything's fine, I should have known, should have known. So it's my pleasure to, to introduce Professor Umit Karabi. He's a professor of computer information technology here at Purdue University. And uh, rather than dwell on his background, I'll let him expand if he'd like a little more. But uh, I don't want to take away any of his time. So for the next half hour or so, please enjoy the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. After the lunch time, so I believe you're already. So um, yes, I'm an assistant professor at the CIT department here on campus, um, Purdue. So uh, primarily, my research is actually on digital forensics and cybersecurity, you know, problems related to forensic aspects, um, definitely. And this talk is going to be, okay, if you're um, familiar with forensic investigations, this talk is going to be interesting when you look at the first word in the title, this targeted part, this is going to be the more, more interesting part. Because you might think, hey, you know, you already um, extract data from mobile devices, which is not a big deal, but when it comes to the targeted part, it's going to actually make a difference. So um, yes, the title is um, Targeted Forensic Data Extraction for Mobile Devices, and this work actually is um, funded by NIJ. Um, it's, it's been a three years project, so we finally um, brought to the end and um, released the final product. So let's get started. So um, my outline is actually briefly, I'm going to be talking about introduction and motivation um, in this work, and the actual problem, what the problem which is related to the targeted extraction. And some high-level system design that we develop is a novel system design. And a um, little bit details about the targeted data extraction system. And then I'm going to be talking about briefly experiments and results and completely the future work. So when we think about the digital forensics, you might have you heard this in a different um, you know, context. But it's in general, it's actually in the, at the intersection of computer science discipline and forensic science discipline. Basically, the techniques we use that those are usually in computer science, information technology, you know, based techniques we use to collect evidence or information for forensic science purposes. So usually, the, um, forensic investigators are dealing with the, the acquisition, um, examination, analysis, and reporting of the digital um, evidence, which are collected from the digital devices. In order to do that, we use forensic tools or digital forensic tools, and they basically provide high level of abstraction for the investigators to perform the, the, the process, the whole process, acquisition, examination, analysis, and reporting process, and make it easy for investigators. And usually, the evidence collected from these devices by using the tools are using the civil or um, criminal cases, mostly which relate to computer incidents or crimes. So why it's becoming an issue in today's technology when we are introduced to so many different technologies that we call them Internet of Things, right? Now we actually tend to tie everything to the Internet of Things because they're all connected. So um, why they're you know, really important in the forensic investigation is simply because we have tremendous amount of information is being saved into the various different devices. Through the synchronization, actually, we double, maybe exponentially increase the you know, um, information saved in our devices. So the problem from the forensic investigator's perspective, how we can get specific information from these devices. Particularly, we focus on the smartphones, because they are actually becoming personal belonging. And the problems we are going to discuss from the criminal, um, well, criminal justice perspective is becoming really an interesting problem. So as you all know, these um, smartphones actually keep significant amount of information and type of information. From our location service, and when their location services are on, we have information every, every point of time at some you know, certain intervals, the location is actually being reported and saved into the entire devices. Uh, not to mention the pictures, videos we take, and messages, you know, all these conversations, including our email communications, somehow saved in some structures in these devices. So since it is actually recognized as a personal belonging, personal um, device, it's not like a computer. When it comes to the criminal cases, uh, uh, referencing to the Riley, Riley v. California case, the courts actually is be, um, start to accept the phones are being uh, investigated should require a specific search warrant. 
What it means really, before writing the uh, versus California, the, the, the case was really, if, if there's a suspect um, getting a cell phone, get the cell phone, because there's a probable cause, and the cell phone actually is, um, you know, falls under the case of the general search warrant. But specifically right now, starting from 2014, the court actually is issuing very specific search warrant for a specific date. Let's say there's a crime happened last night from 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. and the court says you need to get you know uh, text messages and associated pictures if there's any from that time frame specifically. And today's tools that we discussed do not actually you know um, help with this case. So our scope of the research is going to be then. So when the restricted search is given to the investigators, can they both legally? Um, perform the investigations and only look at those information. And from the user privacy perspective, can we protect the privacy of users while investigating their devices? So that's becoming a significant problem. And for example, this is actually a very good case, if the victim or witnesses bring their devices to the police or law enforcement, or any case if they witness the case or victim of a crime, so there is no tool in the, in the current uh, literature that allows actually them to look at specific information from these devices. What happens then? Victims or witnesses do not bring their phones because they might have some personal information in their phones. So how can we, the question is, how can we handle, how can we allow, how can we allow investigators to extract specific information from <coughs> these devices without compromising the privacy of users and also at the same time protect the investigators, you know, by keeping the boundaries or investigation boundaries along the lines of the given consent forms from the from the victims or witnesses. So our solution is targeted data extraction system. Again, our um, assumption is basically making sure that the home devices are voluntarily brought to the law enforcement and consent is given for specific information. Some of the simple scenarios um, that could be a mass shooting, and there are some victims. Um, very classical example for this is the Boston bombing, because basically the case was resolved with the uh, witnesses bringing the um, pictures to the, to the law enforcement and also surrounding cameras, the CCTV cameras actually were capturing some of the videos and, and, and frames they were actually used by law enforcement and those information are used. If the victims wouldn't bring this information to the law enforcement, that would have been actually difficult to identify the suspects. And some other like everyday problems, probably boyfriend, girlfriend, breakups, and if they actually go to the violent um, you know, lines, uh, one of them is actually threatening the other, cyber harassment. In this case, we can, could have been bringing the device to the police, and police would only look at the specific information without looking at the rest of it. And cyberbullying is a significant problem in the schools. That could be also one problem, because the, the minors actually do not tend to, to you know, talk to the law enforcement, because they might also keep some information in their phones and that might be called, you know, problem for them, so they do not share this. So the parents actually, if this um, tool is, was available, then um, parents would have been actually easily bringing the devices without violating the privacy of their um, kids. So what the um, TDAS, our targeted data extraction system allows, basically it has three um, significant components, we can say, and they are closely tied to the subsystem um, components that I'm going to be talking about next. So first of all, we perform metadata filtering. So this is actually interesting, but not surprisingly, it's not really supported by um, the state-of-the-art tools that are being used by law enforcement. The only, only, the only one that's actually allowed recently with the recent updates is the date, date and time of, uh, filtration by the Celebrate um, Touch specific tool. Um, if the others, the rest of the information is only allowed to dump the category of information to the computer. For example, you need only a one contact information from the device, but it only allows you to dump, dump down all the contacts to the computer and find that one um, contact, which is actually totally um, you know, privacy issue because you may not want to share the rest of the contacts with the law enforcement. And it's true for the pictures and also text messages. So meta, meta filtering allows us to basically search information within the given consent if the date, time, location, or even types of data is specified by the user, then they're going to be extracted based on this information. 
And the content-based filtering is using the AI techniques, particularly with machine learning, deep learning techniques. So there are um, specific models that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, we use them to, in order to understand what's in the, in the images so that we can actually only extract the, the relevant information from the device, not looking at some of the pictures um, in the device. And obviously, since this is a digital forensics system, and it has to follow the proper chain of custody, so we make sure this is actually uh, followed so that the law, um, court of law is not going to reject the findings, or the, the findings are going to be admissible in the court. So the, the three subsystems we use to meet these criteria simply is data identification system is making sure the filters are, the most relevant filters are used and applied so that the, the data is available, we know where the data is exactly, and we know which data is going to be extracted. So the, sub, the second subdomain data acquisition system will forensically, by using forensic soundness, will extract this information to the device. And making sure, again, none of the irrelevant information is going to be extracted from the device system. And data validation system at the end will making sure that anything that is actually extracted is not modified during the transition, because that could have been a problem. Otherwise, if the evidence is not reproducible, it's not admissible in the court. So that would be actually a big problem. So we make sure the extracted data is extracted in a forensic sound manner, and it's not uh, it's, its integrity is preserved. And it keeps the logs of the chain of custody, making sure what has been done, where, and why. We keep all this information. And obviously, it generates an investigative report as all other systems perform. So, the data identification system specifically is looking at the four W questions, right? It's what happened, when happened, and where, and who actually is performing. So we pretty much like try to answer all of these questions that usually investigators are looking for. So again, these are not in the general domain. We look at very specific um, information that are related to these questions. And it actually uh, works with the data. Well, it, along with the data identification system, all this information is going to pass through the data acquisition system. And metadata filtering, and along with the machine learning will be applied, depends on what the investigator is actually looking for. I'm going to show you the interface for that too. So what is really interesting with the um, restrictions and also availabilities in both platforms, iOS and Android uh, platforms, I mean, both of them are actually in the market is 99.6%, so we focus on these two. Um, so there are some information that we can extract by using data extraction system. There are some information we can't because first, since the, the, the assumption is that we assume the, the phone is brought voluntarily, so we don't want to root the phone. That means like we don't want to get the root access to the phone by violating the, uh, the warranty. And, or if it's an iOS device, we don't want to jailbreak. So when we don't do that, unfortunately, we have some limitations. So we can perform on-device investigation or off-device investigation. When we do on-device metabase extraction or investigation, we can have actually pictures, videos, contacts, like calendar events, reminders, you know, significant amount of information that are provided by the native applications in the phone and in the, in the Android part. iOS is a little restricted um, with this security perspective, we believe. Um, for some reason, it doesn't allow us to extract the messages and call logs directly. What we do instead, we take the iTunes backup in a secure location without letting the investigator to look at the content, but our tool is going to go through that without revealing the rest of the information to the investigator and looking at those information as well. So we, at the end, by using the on-device or off-device investigation, we are able to extract targeted information for significant amount of information. When it comes to the third-party applications, it's a little problematic for the Android perspective, even though if we have a root access, if you are given with access you know, voluntarily from the um, witnesses or victims of whoever the owner of the phone is, then we can have full access to any of the, um, the third party applications unless they are, their data is encrypted. So in this case, for uh, iOS, we have more capabilities actually to extract, but for Android, we are actually very limited to extracting the information from the on third party applications. But again, the assumption is we are not going to root or jailbreak the information of the phone. If it would have been then, they would have been all yes. Unless, again, if there is um, 
and then encryption mechanism. So what do we, how do we perform the metadata based on extraction? So if you look at the architecture for iOS, the frameworks that, that are available on the system, iOS system, uh, on top of the structure, we have Cocoa Touch. That actually where there's a kind of like application layer. We can um, um, run the applications in that layer and access to the, to the other frameworks in the, in the lower um, layers in the framework. So media libraries basically allow us to um, get the information from the pictures and videos and some audio as well. So it, it, it's a library that allows us to access this information along with their meta information so we can extract all those information and check whether they're within the boundaries of the given consent so that we, we can extract the whole information. Um, and the core ML framework is a very important uh, framework for us so we can deploy our machine learning uh, models so that we can run and look at the content of the pictures and basically develop information from the rest. And if you are familiar, uh, if you, in order to run any machine learning or deep learning uh, models in, in smart devices, that's a uh, great positive uh, structure here, the GPU, it actually is used more than the CPU is being used. So in today's, today's mobile devices, there's a significant improvement so that we can perform our investigations faster. So we use GPU for that purpose. Android is slightly different, but a similar um, you know, structure. On top of the um, architecture stack, we have application layer where we deploy our app. So that app is going to have access to the rest of the frameworks. And the, the, the content provider framework is the, one of the most important frameworks uh, well, structure, I can't say it's not exactly the framework. Um, it allows us to look at the meta information in the third party applications if the developers allow data sharing among the apps. What it means really, for example, if you, if you open your um, like Facebook app on your you know, device, then it asks you to access to your contacts, image gallery, you know, all the rest of the information. That's actually how the applications are sharing information through the content providers. Those are mentioned in the manifest files and based on that given permissions, the applications can share those information. What we do without looking at the actual information, we look at only meta information so we do not compromise the given, given um, consent or in the, in, the, in the criminal case, we do not go beyond the specific search warrant given by the court or judge. And some, of, some other frameworks actually allow us to look at the media, pictures and videos, and content of them. And then some of the SQLite libraries allow us to retrieve information from particularly third-party applications if it is available, because information is kept in the databases. And again, we use GPU most of the time when, when it comes to the machine learning, um, deploying the machine learning models. That's actually a very, um, very fast capability for the mobile devices today. So this is, this is the structure how um, apps are communicating through the content providers. So our TDS application, so we actually show you one case, how it actually connects to the other databases and share information. It basically, through the cursor loader, all the other applications communicate with their own data, database files. And this is one, actually, um, two-way um, you know, kind of bus that information can be shared through our application and the rest of the other applications. So this is actually being done through the content providers and so it's, it's a great opportunity for us. And we do not foresee that this is gonna change in the near future because the newer Android devices are also, Android operating systems are still using the content providers. So how we use machine learning? Um, so well, simply as we all use the, the you know, machine learning in any device, we have our own model, right? So we develop our model and then basically train the model based on some database, some, well, some information, we provide that training set. And then if it is needed, we retrain the model again based on the, based on the classifications we need. And then eventually, you know, uh, deploy it in, into, into our um, smart device so that we can actually carry from the um, data, ex well, not data extraction in this case, data filtering. So what, what um, specific machine learning um, frameworks we use, we use TensorFlow and CAFE frameworks. TensorFlow is, sim uh, is designed by Google. Um, CAFE is uh, the Berkeley Laboratories, AI Laboratories. These are actually uh, very powerful 
um, frameworks and the models, I'm going to discuss which models we use, but they allow us actually to perform significantly faster um, data extraction compared to the other frameworks available. And Android is specifically using TensorFlow Lite. I would like to mention this. Uh, Lite actually became available just one year ago. Um, so when it became available, the size of our application is reduced from 76 megabytes to 7 megabytes. And at the same time, we had significant performance increase. So that's why we switched our TensorFlow to TensorFlow Lite. At that time, unfortunately, the iOS didn't support that. So TensorFlow um, is an open source software library for machine learning um, you know, applications. And we specifically use two different uh, models, Inception V3 and ModelNet. And they are trained on the ImageNet database, 1.3 billion pictures in there. In they, uh, the, the model categorizes the, uh, the input file to the thousand classes, which is actually a significantly large number. So we were only focusing on specific set of um, you know, output class, you know, classes. So I'm going to be talking about they were they were not in the database, but we actually retrain the model and make it fit to our system or or our needs. Cafe is developed by the Berkeley AI Research, and we specifically use Open SF, <coughs> NSFM, um, NSW, sorry, NSSW model. So um, this is actually also a significantly faster model than compared to others. So this is specifically used for this next question. I'm going to be skipping this part um, because it's briefly I talk about it. Basically, we look at the, the Inception V3 model actually is 43 layer model. It's a deep learning. Um, so our convolution neural network is used in the middle of the, um, the model. So we basically look at edges, shapes, and at the, at the last, well, close the, the, the final layers, we have high level features. And in the last three layers, we do classification. So for that reason, since we had different classes, we retrain the last three um, layers to get specific classification for our investigative models. For that purpose, we use transfer learning idea. Basically, the model is trained for a specific task, but our task is different, however, related to the, that task. So we can use transfer learning by retraining the final layers to make sure that the model also fits to our case. In this case, we you know, train that and specifically look at these cases. We, these are all um, identified by the law, our communication with the law enforcement in three different states. Uh, so we finally came up with four different cases. One is the definitely weapons. They want to identify, automatically identify some of the weapons related to you know, cyberbullying or cyber harassment cases. They say, like, I'm going to kill you and send a you know, picture of a knife or a picture of a you know, gun. So in those cases, we identify the weapons. And drug usage definitely is uh, one of the significant cases, and hit and run cases, basically car crashes. The, the victims usually take, sorry, uh, witnesses usually take the picture of the car when it's happening and then share it with the law enforcement. And some of the uh, terrorist attacks. These are related to the bombing cases specifically. So when we use TensorFlow um, in the identification of the weapons, as you see in the in the first picture, it was actually pretty clear that they were all guns. I mean, unless they use like their hands like this. That could have been also a recognized gun, unfortunately. Uh, but we have high probability that these are guns. In the second case, however, there are some of the guns, but because of the you know, contrast and the image quality, our model doesn't really you know, um, identify those. But which is still OK, because we still have one picture here. But there could be some, unfortunately, some false negatives. And this could have been one of those false negatives in our investigation. But again, we try to have highest level as possible. I'm going to be sharing the, the results with you in a moment. But in this case, we are missing two pictures. So this is the high level design for the, uh, design for the communication. So this is itself also, we can call it a null design, because none of the tools, forensic tools, actually allow this type of um, you know, communication. So we allow the investigators to use USB device. In this case, actually, we move this to the SSD drive because it's, it's way faster. Um, we use an SSD drive. Everything is located in the SSD drive. And investigators will be just plug and play fashion, will run our system on an operating, operating system. And they can use any, any laptop or any computer in the scene. So the reason that we want to do this is because we want to reduce the cost of law enforcement 
they don't have to purchase like five thousand uh, dollars laptop that is actually forensically capable of performing you know evidence collection or analysis. And that could be a Wi-Fi communication, Wi-Fi access point, or wired communication, depends on the you know needs that the investigator actually wants to perform this. So we allow both communication. Um, so there are some app so there are some applications and tools that are available in the tool that are going to be automatically loaded to the system, and then if our app is going to be pushed to the phone, and it's going to just pop up the consent form, and investigators well, investigators and the users will sit down and give the consent, and then once they approve, only the targeted data is going to be, is going to be collected. So this is the um, Android interface specifically. So this is what the the consent form actually look like. So um, usually consent forms are like paper-based, but we use a um, digital version in this case. So we provide them some you know, shortcuts and then some of the information. It actually goes down with the machine learning as well. So based on the information they provide, within, within these boundaries, we don't go outside. We do not let the investigator go outside. The, the phone is locked. They can't do anything else uh, other than looking at the information within this you know, consent. So this is the iOS, so we use the two different designs, so just to give the law enforcement and choose the best option. So iOS has different de design than um, you know, Android. iOS actually looks at the when, where, what, you know, and who questions usually. So we just want to give them a different design. So this is the model how we create the, the exported data. This is very important from the forensic soundness perspective because we want to make sure we keep the hash value of all the information we extract and then save it for the future cases so that if the, if the information is altered by the user, victim in this case, or during the communication, we can identify what information is being corrupted. So just to make sure that all the, all the performed activities are gonna be reproduced by the other investigators in the case of that the, the victim or witness case actually turns to be criminal case. This is the save, and the report actually looks like this. It's going to provide so many information that are needed for the investigators to testify in court. Um, and these are our um, devices that we actually tested our um, system on. So at that time, we were actually had, we had iPhones 8, 7, and some other you know, devices. So we had populated the devices with significant amount of information, mimicking that some of the users might have like thousands of pictures. So in that case, how well our, our tool actually performs. Some people don't really do anything, right? I mean, they just keep some information on their phones and they don't like to take pictures, no videos, few people in their contact list. So that's what we imitated. We have, um, we covered pretty much like all type of users in this case. So we tested for so many different categories. We look at the pictures only, we look at the videos only, we look at the combination, like the text messages, contacts, and related pictures, if there is any. All of these, with the different you know, information, we collected all these um, you know, values. What is actually important here is the time for, for extraction. For, it's interesting that we also tested this against the state-of-the-art forensic tools that law enforcement actually is using. So the, the time that takes to you know, perform this investigation is significantly reduced. If you look at it, it's just you're talking about seconds. And this is very important, and it's actually desired by the investigators is because they don't have time to keep the you know, victims in the, in the police station during the investigation. Because they want to go away. So they have minutes, they are running with the minutes to get to the latest information so that the investigation can be done. Otherwise, they don't really want to share their data. Imagine you know, 17 years old, you know, teenager, and leaving the phone for three hours, that could be catastrophe for them, right? <laughs> so that's exactly why we are targeting like seconds or minutes in this case. And we have been actually very quiet quite successful for this. And at the end, the reason you might say, yes, it's seconds is because you're only extracting 10 megabytes. <coughs> that's, that's true. But in order to ex extract only 10 megabytes, today's technologies do not allow this. They dump 32 gigabytes down and then get the 10 you know, uh, megabyte out of it. So that is actually metadata filtering, and this is the content-based filtering. So we use, again, mobile net and inception V3. So our accuracy, I'm going to take your attention to the accuracy, is actually varies, you know, depending on the type of the pictures we had at that time. So we had really bad accuracy, like 25%. 
there was actually one instant, instance actually we had, we wanted to share this because of the, the vehicle actually was from the different angle and there was a background of like trees and they were also, they actually looked like also some, you know, uh, vehicle type. So we had very low accuracy, but the rest of it actually were pretty good. So we can have, you know, solid um, results that are, uh, you know, tool actually is performing good accuracy with the um, extraction. Yes. Are these mostly false positives or false negatives? So if you can take a look at these, these are all, well, we actually took all of them into account. These are all true positives, we take them, okay. and also true negatives. So we want to make sure, because in the forensic investigation, right, investigation, right, if you miss something and you say, I couldn't find anything, that, that's a big problem. But if there are 10 pictures, 10 related pictures to your case, but you got one of them, you're good to go. You can miss the rest of the nine, that's perfectly fine. But if you miss 10 of them, that's a significant problem. <laughs> when you go to the court, you can't say, I couldn't find anything. Maybe the other person would have you know, found it. And when we compared it to the two different um, tools, named Axiom and Paragon at the time, so we had significant um, you know, time right here, for example, we, we performed the 14 seconds for the exporting with our tool, and it took 29 minutes for the axiom, magnet axiom tool to only extract some colloques. So, and when we compare with the IOS, IOS was actually problematic when it comes to the off-device investigation. If you remember, I mentioned that, that we need to extract the iTunes backup for very specific information. When it is actually involved, we are at the same level as other tools. It takes like minutes. But when it is not involved, like if you are not interested in messages, then our actually um, call logs, for example, it only takes like 0.1 seconds plus 15 milliseconds. So still a very significant improvement in, you know, with respect to the um, time compared to others, because others also take like 10 minutes at least initial time and nine minutes initial time and 38 minutes extra time plus 0.4 seconds. So in short, our tool is, is a null uh, investigative tool for law enforcement. We distribute it to the law enforcement they are currently using and giving us, a, giving, giving us feedback. And we designed this for the victim or witness cases. However, we are so happy that some of the investigators from New Jersey, they are actually using this for the criminal cases, again, because they have received search warrant from the um, judge saying that you have to only look at the pictures and at this time. So, and it, it seems like it's actually working well for both cases, victim witness and also criminal cases or, or offender cases. So that's actually good news and it, it performs very good, you know, uh, results with the metadata, it's 100% almost, um, but with the, you know, um, content-based filtering, we are improving this quality by developing our tools. Now we are actually in the middle of developing our own models for deep learning models so that we can have better accuracies for specifically for these type of um, you know, um, cases for, for different categories. And we are also looking at the, some natural language processing models and developing our own um, algorithm for the specific keywords. <coughs> so we are in the process of getting some information from the law enforcement. They have a um, database of um, some you know, illicit content in the text messages being shared. So by using their data, we are gonna train our system and look at specific uh, keywords like hatred or you know, like um, threatening someone, threatening words. So by using the um, NLP, we are going to look at these uh, text messages, not only the pictures of this case. Yes? Yeah, I, I might have missed this. When the, when the judge says you can only view, say, photos, yeah. Is that you can only view photos or you can you can look at everything but you can only use photos? That's a very good point. You can't look at the pictures. That's exactly what the case for the New Jersey. Um, I told them, I said, oh, you know, because it's going to take a little time for us to prepare another system for them. I told them, like, do you celebrate Taj? Because, because he said they only look at the time and also pictures, time and pictures. And I said, like, you celebrate because celebrate allows um, celebrate time specifically allows the daytime filtration. He said, no, 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 we can't look at it because celebrate also shows us the rest of the pictures and we are not sure that how this is going to be validated because celebrate is a black box. We don't know how the process is going on. 
But for our tool, it's an open source tool, and we, we guarantee that we don't look at the content, we don't show the content to the investigators. Everything is actually happening in the background, on the system, and we are not showing that information to the investigators. Does it answer your question? And eventually, that's actually a future goal um, outside of the grant, actually, that was the part of the grant. Uh, we are going to look at age detection. It's a significant problem, um, but we'll be looking at particularly some ages above 25, because for 17 to 23, it's so hard to detect. So we are going to look at the above 25 or below 12 or 14. So that's what we are going to do, develop our new models for the you know, crimes against each other. I am. Well, good time. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Question. Are there any safeguards in place with being an open source software to prevent law enforcement from extracting extra data, or is it possible to send all the scope of data outside the scope of the investigation? For, I mean, related to our application? Right. Um, we do not, uh, there's, that's a good part of like giving them the SSDs, right? So we give them the SSD drive that actually has only our applications and investigators do not you know, download anything. There shouldn't be any like viruses, trojans, anything in the SSD drive you provide them. With respect to the phone, if there's any, like malware or any anti-forensic applications in the phone, uh, we haven't tested that, that's a good point, but we are not requesting any information from them unless they somehow like hijack to the uh, content provider and doesn't allow us to you know, get information, we haven't looked at it. That's a good point. We didn't look at the anti-forensic pers you know, perspective. We look at it, we're assuming that this is a victim or witness case, right? They are volunteer to bring their phones and they will be aware of any anti-forensic tools, hopefully. I mean, applications in the phone. Do we have time? Yes. Okay, one more. Here we go. Uh, so, um, I'm wondering how, how can you make sure that your app those apps like uh, running to extract the data is secure enough because you, you are able to extract those data under those like constant like with a user's agreement, right? But what if attackers try to like get the data you extracted? Yeah, how do you make sure that your app is secure enough? Well, there are two different things. How our app is secure or how securely we extract information. There are two different things. Um, so how our app is secure, we didn't pay attention to the security of our, our app, whether it can be hacked or, you know, because that wasn't really the scope of our, you know, design. This is the prototype system, first. Second, how securely we extract information is perfectly secure. Why? Because we want to make sure the forensic, you know, um, process also includes the data is not altered during the, you know, communication. So we make sure that that communication, if it is wired, then it's, almost difficult to, you know, you know, ad hoc and get the information from there. But it's a wireless. We want to make sure that the investigators, they use their own access points and they are secure now. And they're actually you know, aware of this and they do use those, you know, secure access points, which is usually the vehicles. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.